to the September Blue Trails Guide webinar series. My name is Faye Augustin, and I'm the Colorado River Basin Associate Director for American Rivers. I'm really pleased that all of you um, were able to join us for our webinar this month, Source Water Protection, What It Is and How to Fund It. As usual, I'll take a couple of minutes here at the beginning of the webinar to go through some um, support help. Um, if your connection is lost at any time during the webinar, please log in again using your unique web link and passcode that was provided to you with your GoToWebinar email. Uh, as always, this webinar is being recorded and will be available uh, next Monday, October 2nd, for viewing at bluetrailsguide.org backslash blog. Um, we'll also send out the, uh, the link in an email to everyone uh, next week. If you have any other issues as things are moving forward during the webinar, please feel free to email me um, and I will try to help troubleshoot any questions that you have. As always, we encourage questions um, to ask any and all questions throughout the webinar. Uh, in your GoToWebinar side panel, there's a question box. Please feel free to type in your questions um, at that time um, that, that you have them or you're welcome to save them until the end of the webinar. We'll leave about five minutes um, to answer as many questions as we can. And those that are not answered, um, I'll work with Raven to get those questions answered after the webinar, and they will be available with the GoToWebinar link um, on our, on our uh, blog at bluetrailsguide.org backslash blog. And then one quick reminder, um, with GoToWebinar, there is about a three to five second delay with the slides, so just be patient um, as we start to move forward with the presentation. And without further ado, I want to uh, welcome our presenter for today, Raven Lawson. She is the Watershed Protection Manager at the Central Arkansas Water, the state's largest drinking water utility, which serves one in every seven Arkansans. Ms. Lawson earned her bachelor's degree in biology from Arkansas State <clears throat> and attended graduate school at Clemson University where she studied wildlife and fisheries ecology. She's currently working towards her PSM in natural resource management from Texas Tech. For nearly 15 years, Raven has worked in many aspects of ecology and natural resource management, ranging from studying upland plants, aquatic organisms, and their systems, to working in public education and water quality advocacy. In her current position, she and her team are responsible for the protection and management of over 12,000 plus acres of watershed lands owned by the utilities and are charged with ensuring that over 450,000 Arkansans have clean, safe drinking water. And the plants, animals, and people of the Lake Mommy and Lake Winona watersheds have a thriving place to call home. So without further ado, Raven, thank you so much for participating in our webinar today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Faye, for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. I'd like to begin by thanking American Rivers for allowing me to present on this platform and by thanking all of you for tuning in to today's webinar. If you're just joining us and missed the introduction, my name is Raven Lawson and I'm the Watershed Protection Manager at Central Arkansas Water in Little Rock. I'm a born and raised Arkansan who grew up on some of our great rivers here in the natural state. I often say that my journey to where I began today, uh, or where I am today, began in a red old town canoe when I was about 15 years old, which I still have, by the way. I was very excited to share a river photo with the audience today and quickly chose this one, only to realize that it's in fact not an American river. <laughs> this is actually a New Zealand river, so I apologize for that. In this webinar, I will first orient you a little to CAW and our watersheds. Then I'll talk about our program, the catalyst for taking a more comprehensive approach to watershed management, how we use our funding mechanism, and how it came to be. So let's begin. Central Arkansas Water serves 450,000 Arkansans with safe, high quality water. That makes us the largest drinking water utility in the state. One in every seven Arkansans benefit from CAW service, and we supply this water from two reservoirs, Lake Maumelle and Lake Winona. If you'll follow along on the um, screen here, Lake Winona is here in Perry County. That's the oldest of our two reservoirs. 
And then Lake Maumelle, more here in the center of the screen, is the source for two thirds of our daily water demand. The red lines on this map indicate the raw water transmission lines from our reservoirs to our two, two treatment plants. In really defining what is source water protection, what we're really talking about is watershed protection, but with but watershed protection specifically for drinking water sources. So we'll start with what is a watershed? Well, a watershed is the area of land where all of the water that's under it, on it, or drains off of it goes into the same place. So in this photo here, if you're standing where I am, when I took this photo, you can see Lake Winona off into the distance back here. I'm actually standing on the northwest rim of the Lake Winona watershed. If it were raining, all of the rain falling off my face and off the front of my boots would have the potential to impact this watershed. This is called runoff, and as it moves over our landscape, it cleans the surface and takes with it things like soil, pet waste, fertilizers, oil from our cars, leaf litter, and other potential pollutants. So again, source water protection is really watershed protection that encompasses all of these elements for the protection of our drinking water sources. On this slide, we've got our two watersheds again. So Lake Winona down here on the left-hand corner. And you can see the purple outline here is the watershed outline. The smaller, uh, water, or the smaller outlines in the middle are our sub watershed basins. This is the Lake Maumelle watershed in the center much larger, 88,000 acres, this purple line all the way around uh, here. If you'll notice the cross-hatched area on this section of the screen um, completely surrounds Lake Winona. This land is U.S. Forest, Man US Forest Service managed land in the Washita National Forest, and it adds a certain level of protection for that watershed. And while we do have that level of protection, in the Maumelle River headwaters here, that's not a protection that covers the entire watershed of Lake Maumelle. Therefore, today's focus will be on Lake Maumelle and the Lake Maumelle Watershed Management Plan. This photo here is of Lake Maumelle and the watershed. Um, the watershed's actually everything west of this mountain here. If you're ever in the central Arkansas area, I encourage you to come check out this geological landmark called Pinnacle Mountain. I once heard it referred to as the volcano that never was and never will be. So even though it's not a volcano, it makes for a good story, a tough hike, and beautiful views. If you visit Pinnacle Mountain State Park, boulder up to the top of it and wave down at me and my crew as, we, uh, as you take in the be beautiful view of the lake and the watershed. <coughs> But while we're here enjoying this view, it's important to note that the Lake Maumelle watershed is 52% in private ownership. It is still currently 91% forested. So in the 61 years since it was built, not a whole lot has changed in the watershed landscape wise. So if we're 91% in forest cover and not much is changing on the landscape, why is it necessary to invest in watershed protection? Well, most simply, it's because we have an aging reservoir. If you follow this graph, you'll notice there's a fluctuation among internal, in, internal nutrients as it relates to the age of the reservoir. Early on in reservoir life, there's this high amount of nutrient loading in the system. But as the reservoir progresses in age, it cures, so to speak, and learns how to balance these internal nutrients through trophic equilibrium. This could go on indefinitely. However, as we all know, internal nutrients are not the only nutrients impacting our reservoirs. Over time, external nutrients begin entering the system through things like forest degradation, improper management of agricultural lands, <clears throat> development, and so on. As more of this enters the reservoir, it creates an imbalance in the system, and we have the potential for this tipping point or point of no return to occur. And that's very hard to recover from, and which we all know greatly affects our water quality and our ability to treat raw water. 
So where are we at Lake Maumelle? Well, we're right here in this sweet spot. External nutrient loading has been somewhat constant to this point. If external loadings were to increase, would we hit this tipping point? Theory suggests it's a good possibility. If we were focusing on Lake Winona, our smaller watershed, we may not be as concerned about a potential increase in external nutrient loading due to the nature of it being surrounded by national forests. However, the Lake Maumel watershed is largely privately owned properties and its proximity to the Little Rock makes it a desirable location for development. As you see in this bottom left photo, the city of Little Rock is expanding and large developments continue to ease towards the watershed. <clears throat> this is Lake Maumel here and this is the city limits of Little Rock. These photos demonstrate what development in the watershed could look like. This photo is the same area, yet at the edge of sprawl here, as this photo, just inside the watershed. It's actually about here. These areas are very close together geographically, you know, just a few miles apart, but they look very, they look vastly different. In fact, this development pressure in these areas just inside the watershed was a reality. Prior to the recession and housing market collapse, large scale developments were being proposed just off the one quarter mile buffer held by the utility. That's this peach area here. That one quarter mile buffer and these proposed developments were within just a few miles of our intake that supplies two thirds of our daily demand. Luckily, the sign of the times played in our favor and we were able to look at into the potential effects a little more closely. Realizing that development was moving forward and taking caution from some previous studies that suggested development could impact the water supply, the utility contracted Tetratech to study and model build out scenarios and develop the Lake Maumelle Watershed Management Plan. In shortest terms, what they found was that the existing water quality was exceptional. However, these build out scenarios would in fact degrade the current water quality and would not support suggested limits on specified parameters. An important thing to note here is that the management plan also stated that no single management option could meet all of the objectives. Therefore, a combination of methods and actions are needed. We would need a whole suite of management techniques in order to protect the Lake Maumelle watershed and doing any one of them, say prohibiting development for instance, just wouldn't cut it on its own. The plan sets targets for water quality parameters, including total organic carbon, turbidity, and phosphorus, and suggests a number of management strategies, regulations, and actions in order to remain within those target limits. One of the major actions suggested in the plan was to purchase an additional 1,500 acres of land in the Lake Maumel watershed. <clears throat> These 1,500 acres was the required amount needed to offset exemption square footage among the development of current properties for legacy watershed landowners. So those owning and developing lands prior to any suggested regulation or code changes. That way they could continue to develop their property in some ways. While the recognized benefit of having properties and conservation lands for those offsets is of our primary concern, we also recognize the greater benefit that our watersheds serve and realize that simply having offset property for mitigation in, in reality may not be enough. A 2015 study by Earth Economics put an estimated value on the Lake Maumelle watershed in its current condition at $1.5 to $11 billion over the next 100 years. This is based on estimates provided by primary and secondary, or as the slide says, those co-benefits. Primary benefits being those that provide a direct benefit to the utility, so things like water quality, water capture, conveyance, and supply. The secondary benefits of the watershed are those <clears throat> direct and indirect benefits to the utility and the communities it serves. So things like air quality, aesthetic value, habitat, recreation, et cetera. The 100 year asset value here at the bottom of the screen is the thought that these intact watersheds actually appreciate in value over time 
That is that they provide more water to more people for a greater value than they would have 100 years ago. Unlike a built asset, say a factory, that would actually depreciate in value over time. With all of this information, you've probably surmised that we decided that acquiring properties is not only mandatory for offsets, but also <clears throat> comes with numerous other benefits as well. To date, we have purchased over 2,600 acres of property and have about another 130 on deck to close starting actually this afternoon and into the next couple of weeks. We have also placed nearly 300 acres in a conservation easement, and that conservation easement's over here on the left-hand side of the screen. All of this to finally get to how we did it. That was a question also brought to us by the citizens who were involved in the plan formation process. If we were going to have to acquire 1,500 acres, how are we going to pay for it? And that's when the proposed watershed protection fee came about. We now have our board adopted watershed protection fee that is on every metered account within our distribution system, whether that be through retail or wholesale customers. This fee is transparent and is explicitly labeled on each bill, as you can see in the slide. The typical fee is 45 cents per meter per month, and it now generates a little over $1 million a year. This money is held in its own account and is strictly used for acquisitions and conservation needs on those acquired properties. To tell you a little bit more about how we got there, in 2008, a resolution adopted by our Board of Commissioners set forth the purpose of this fee and set limitations on its use. The original adoption created a flat 45 cent fee for all meters across the board and capped the fund balance at $3 million. Four years later, that resolution was amended to remove the $3 million cap and added a number of fee levels based on meter size, which can be seen in this chart. Surprisingly, these, these changes were citizen driven. So the question I'm most asked about our fee, and what an, one that I'm sure many of you are wanting to ask is why is the fee 45 cents? Well, quite simply, at the time it was brought up for adoption in 2008, every dollar counted among American households, right? Well, the thought was that once you hit anything over 50 cents, you started cutting into someone's dollar. If you backed it down to 45 cents, it was perceived much less noticeable that balance between feeling charitable and feeling a financial crunch. And it gave us a good annual amount to work with. In recent months, we've actually been asked to review this and those same citizen groups who originally drove the creation of the fee are now pushing for the increase to be, you guessed it, $1. We've come a long way in our financial security in 10 years. <clears throat> we try to make the best use of the watershed protection fee funds. We focus our purchases on land that is available. We don't currently seek out property. People come to us when they're ready to sell. But we also place an importance on purchases on high priority tributaries, other riparian areas, and other water quality critical elements within the watershed. You see the areas in red are properties that we've purchased since the creation of the plan. And if you'll recall, the watershed management plan called for the purchase of 1,500 acres of offset land. I've already mentioned that we've well surpassed that number, but in the 10 years since the plan's adoption, we've only needed to use a total of four acres of mitigation land for 47 projects. Most of these projects are very small square footage and typically less than a tenth of an acre. But that 45 cents only gets us so far. <clears throat> we have big management objectives and goals. And quite frankly, we do a lot more than simply purchase property. We take part in active management of these properties. When I talk about what we do in the Watershed Protection Program, I typically divide these topics into these seven focus areas. You'll notice that item number one is land acquisition and conservation. That's where our watershed protection fee comes into play. We are purchasing and conserving these properties. And while we have a million dollars in funds coming into that account each year, we really try to reserve those funds for acquisitions and the major conservation needs on those properties that we purchase. Things like reforestation or restoration projects. Not to mention 
that $1 million is a little deceiving. In order to purchase larger tracts of land, we often have to do some level of financing. So as those funds are generated, much of that total balance is going into a debt service of properties we've already purchased. So we really never have a million dollars. So we have to get creative when it comes to long-term management and monitoring and all these other areas that fall under watershed protection. At CAW, we operate as any other department in the utility and use annual operating funds to carry out daily activities of management and maintenance, such as prescribed fire, mowing, monitoring, equipment purchases, staffing, et cetera. We personally feel it's a top-notch top -notch investment for the utility, and we're pretty fortunate to be able to operate within its structure. As a drinking water utility, we recognize the importance of not only protecting the landscape from sediment and nutrient inputs that inevitably come from development, but as I've already mentioned, we choose to actively manage the landscape. It would be easy to buy the properties, put up a fence and do nothing with them, but the landscape itself can also pose certain threats. Remember that definition of runoff? When our landscapes are not properly cared for or managed, we run the risk of creating disinfection byproducts or DBPs. DBPs are formed naturally when chlorine used in the treatment or disinfection process bind with carbons found in the raw water. Where do these, water, these carbons come from? Well, every living thing is made of carbon. So the plants and animals of the watershed release these carbons through the simplest processes like dropping leaves or decomposing. These combined elements of chlorine and carbon are our DBPs. Chloroform, for example, is one of four major DBPs that can be found in drinking water. Why is this important? Well, the levels of DBPs are regulated by the EPA and are a potential carcinogen when found in high enough amounts. Now, I don't wanna cause any alarm. <laughs> know that we are highly regulated to staying within those safe limits, but a big part of staying within those limits is by eliminating these carbons before they ever reach the treatment process. There are multiple ways of doing this, but we can start by managing them on the landscape through things like prescribed fire, ecological timber thinning, and native plant restoration. In short, in short, healthy forests equal healthy water, and healthy tributaries equal healthy and safe source waters. By taking care of our landscape, we can save money in the treatment process and make it as safe as possible, and ultimately, we can then pass these savings on to our customers and provide them with an affordable resource for meeting their daily needs. So going back to what we do, a quick example of some of the properties and what we do with them is our highlight property here. This is the 915 acres of the former Winrock grass farm, which was used to grow sod for golf courses from coast to coast. This property was purchased using, using the U.S. Forest Service Forest Legacy Funding. To our knowledge, we've been the only recipients of the grant to date that wasn't purchasing forested land but using the funds to purchase a reforestable landscape, which was part of the requirements to fulfill the funding obligations. We have planted 44,000 trees on 140 of these acres, installed a stream bank stabilization project, and have scheduled a low water crossing removal and non-forested habitat implementation plans for critical wildlife species, such as monarchs, pollinators, and quail. We also have our field office, shop building, and a classroom on the property. I know what you're thinking. Is this realistic? Is CAW a rare exception? Can we use them as a template? How can we pull off something like this in our own watershed? Well, we sure hope you can. And hopefully you can take with you some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. First, understand that protecting and managing a watershed requires significant resources and that your entity has to be committed for the long term. We don't do anything on less than a 20 year schedule, but our plans and visions are more on the 100 year timeframe. It's of utmost importance to have a technically sound plan developed with stakeholder input, but make sure those stakeholders understand the implementation of the plan must be flexible and adaptable, and be sure you keep them in the loop in terms of progress needed or changes that need to be made. They really just wanna make sure that you're still using the plan they helped to create. 
and monitor, monitor, monitor. If you aren't monitoring, you can't adapt and adjust when necessary, and you can't prove that your investment was worthwhile. I've simply included this slide to demonstrate the vast importance of a diversity of stakeholders and their input. We have representatives from city government, large watershed landowners like Delta Temper Corporation, for example, and smaller residential representatives in the watershed, ratepayers, civic clubs, non-government organizations, et cetera. All of these groups have an invested interest in the watershed for one reason or another, and they were able to provide valuable input and guidance into the formation of our watershed management plan. I'm going to guess that you're also saying, a big management plan would be awesome to have, but what if we don't have the resources to get one done now, but what we are ready to do is get a funding mechanism in place. Well, from what we've learned in the process, I'd offer these two key points to consider when getting started. One, determine your level of commitment. Do you want to simply purchase property or do you want to do restoration projects, active management, monitoring? Who will do it? Who will do the management and monitoring? Will it be paid for with these funds or some other funds? Number two, document and communicate. Documentation is key, and keeping everyone informed is key. You need to identify everyone who needs to know about these plans and make sure they are at the table. Residents, consumers, partners, lawmakers, whoever you think needs to know. Describe to them exactly what you plan to do with the money and why you're doing it. How will the money be collected? What are the contingencies? How will you adapt and adjust if needed? Is there a mechanism in place that will allow you to make these adjustments? Just some things to think about. Sorry, I forgot that slide. Here you go, those are those points. And lastly, don't forget about leveraging your funds with valuable partnerships. These entities can help you accomplish your management and monitoring goals. They can help you do education and outreach and can often do this at little or no cost. Here in Arkansas, we are extremely blessed with great partnerships and we have no shortage of help or expertise when it comes to watershed management, and we are forever ever thankful for that. And I'll end my presentation where our job of source water protection ends. That's the intake from which our water is pumped from the lake to the treatment process. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and have learned something from our process. I'll not now hand it back over to Faye, and we'll see if we can answer any questions you may have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Raven, for that really um, helpful and interesting presentation on the terrific work that uh, you and your utility have done over the last 10 years. Um, I want to remind everyone that um, you have a question box in your GoToWebinar side panel. So if you have questions um, still lingering, please feel free to go ahead and ask them. Um, we've got a few minutes to answer some questions, so we'll get to as many um, as we can. And those that are not answered, again, will be available um, on the blog at AmericanRivers.org backslash blog uh, next Monday, October 2nd. So Raven, one question for you um, that's come up is surrounding the challenges and your um, project. What was the biggest challenge um, that you all faced in implementing this project? So from planning to setting up the fee to the ongoing management. I really think it was getting all the stakeholders, one, to the table and getting everyone to have the same understanding of really what a watershed management plan is meant to do, what it's not meant to do, and uh, the full process and scope of it. Um, by getting all of these people at the table, you can imagine between, you know, city governments and um, small non-government organizations or your average um, watershed residents, they have a lot of different stakes in what goes on in the watershed and a lot of different ideas on what should and shouldn't be done. So really just setting that precedent from the beginning and working through that formation process was probably the biggest challenge to overcome. The rest of it's really come um, pretty organically over time. Uh, starting with um, the citizens actually being the drivers of the watershed management fee. Great, um, and that and the next question is a great follow-up to what you just said about the water management fee. Um, what was your marketing process for letting uh, users and, and utility users know about um, the fee itself, and did you have any pushback from that originally? 
Oh, that's a great question. And I wish I were here when that actually went into place, but I wasn't. But from what I know um, and I've been told, they, um, you know, it, it goes through a process. So um, one, it was brought to our board of commissioners from citizen groups who had already gathered constituencies um, in favor of the process. Then it had to be approved by two city boards. So the city of Little Rock and the city of North Little Rock had to approve. Um, pass their approval onto us before it could be implemented. And so after that, it was a series of press releases and um, some notifications in the bills as they were mailed out, just letting them know that they'd see this new fee come up on their um, bill um, in the upcoming months. And um, that's, that's really how it was rolled out. Um, there really wasn't any pushback. I think the education was there and the backing and the knowing that the cities backed it from the beginning didn't really cause any pushback um, when we implemented it. <clears throat> That's great. And I think we have um, just one more quick question that we'll try and finish up here in the last minute or so. Um, so the, the final question, Raven, is again around funding. Um, you mentioned that the um, the fee goes primarily towards the um, the actual acquisition of new of new land. How do you pay for the other aspects of work that you mentioned on the call? Okay, so a lot of that is actually rolled into our operating budget within the utility. Um, now, if we want to do some large scale stuff um, that we don't want to finance or find, you know, we can't find a grant for it, something like that. Um, we will use those conservation funds for that. But typically we um, partner with so many entities, there's usually some kind of grant available to offset some of the projects that we do. Um, and our daily activities really are um, taken care of in our operating budget. Excellent. Um, well, thank you again, Raven, for the really amazing presentation. And thank um, all of you, our listeners, for participating in our webinar and for your terrific questions. We've got a couple other questions um, that we will answer uh, on the blog um, when we release the uh, recorded webinar next Monday, um, October 2nd. So um, stay tuned for that. And thank you all for participating. And I, I encourage you to join us next month in October. Um, for our October webinar, where we'll be talking um, with a representative from the city of Santa Fe about their watershed um, education program. So thank you again, Raven, for the terrific presentation. And thank you all for participating. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a great rest thank of your you. afternoon. You too.